Thank you very much, Mark. And I want to also thank the, uh, the Institute uh, for the invitation and for the important work that you're doing, which I have uh, just begun to learn about from reading about your work on, on the web uh, after you extended the invitation to me. So uh, as Mark said, I'm a law professor at NYU and my expertise is particularly in the area of democracy, uh, the way democracy is structured, the legal framework for democracy, the institutions of democracy, uh, primarily in the U.S. and under U.S. law, but also with some comparative perspective on other countries. And uh, I thought that since that's my area of expertise and Mark asked me to speak about the issues I know best, I would talk to you uh, about that set of issues. Uh, now, uh, I'm very curious to hear, you know, as we have time for discussion about how these more formal issues about the organization of politics affect the way you think about cultural diplomacy. Uh, I want to talk some about the political culture of democracy, uh, particularly what's been happening uh, in many of the democracies around the world, not just uh, in the United States, but uh, certainly in Europe uh, and in a number of other uh, parts of, of the world. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of uh, the Cold War, uh, there was the thought for a period of time that we were kind of moving into an era that was the triumph of liberal democracy. Uh, and in fact, uh, the famous commentary at the time suggested uh, that there were no real alternatives uh, anymore that were viable uh, as competitors to uh, liberal democracy. Um, and since that moment of sort of optimism uh, and that moment uh, in the end of the, uh, the 1990s uh, in which we moved into what I at the time called the age of democracy myself, uh, more new, new democracies having been formed uh, over the, the decade at the end of the Cold War than in any previous moment in world history. Um, since that moment, uh, we have actually, over the last decade or 15 years, um, experienced uh, much more serious disaffection and alienation and anxiety about democracy, uh, the future of democracy, the state of democracy, both in some of the longest established democracies, the consolidated democracies, including in the United States, uh, and in some of the more recently established democracies that uh, emerged after uh, the end of the Cold War. Um, and uh, we've seen that get expressed in a variety of ways, including the rise of what you might call more populist kinds of politics in many countries, many, many democracies, uh, reflecting a kind of uh, uh, alienation from government, uh, alienation from the so-called political elites uh, that have governed uh, in these countries, uh, complaints about the traditional political parties, uh, the emergence of various populist kinds of political figures, populist movements, uh, populist political parties, uh, Germany, for example, which in, in many ways has been more immune from a lot of these developments than a number of other countries. Uh, but even in Germany, uh, with elections coming up uh, uh, this weekend, uh, you know, Germany has seen the rise of a populist political party, uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Euro, uh, anti-European political party uh, that looks right now to stand a good chance of gaining uh, enough support in the elections to become a, a, a player in the German parliament uh, for the first time since World War II, the rise of a, uh, a, a, a political party like this that has enough support in Germany uh, to actually hold a significant enough seats in the parliament to have representation. Um, so uh, partly I want to talk about uh, how to think about this, at least from my perspective. Uh, there are some large structural forces that are driving this, I think, but then there's some more specific things about the way democracy is actually organized institutionally that contribute to this. Um, so putting this in, a, in the larger context first, uh, 
two things to keep in mind or to sort of have perspective on. Um, one is that, uh, as you know, uh, we had the, the tremendous economic uh, dislocation, pain, uh, and, and uh, crises triggered by the 2008 financial crisis or meltdown uh, that's affected most countries in the world. Uh, and one of the things that may be helpful perspective here is that people who have studied financial crises and their aftermath politically uh, have uh, established that it's actually uh, n quite common in the history of democracies that in the aftermath of these kinds of financial recessions, uh, you see the rise of populist politics from both the left, on both the left and the right of the political spectrum. Uh, these, these financial crises are much more painful than ordinary economic downturns or ordinary economic recessions in democracy. They tend to last much longer, eight to 10 years. So the duration of these problems is much more significant than ordinary economic uh, meltdowns or recessions. Uh, and it's not surprising in the aftermath of that kind of situation that people who have suffered uh, whose living conditions are worse off, feel that government is not responding, government's not capable of addressing their concerns, the traditional political parties are not capable of doing anything for them, uh, and it's a pattern that we see recurringly over the last hundred years in democracies experiencing these kinds of crises. Uh, now, in some ways, that's a positive story in the sense that um, to the extent countries managed to return to more significant levels of economic growth, uh, as has occurred to some extent in the United States, more slowly in Europe. Um, it suggests that some of that populist alienation and anger that's driving our politics today uh, may diminish. Um, the second big structural kind of force driving the rise of this populist politics in so many places, I think, is uh, the cultural sense of, of uh, rapid change that many places are experiencing with the rise of, of significant levels of immigration uh, into uh, a variety of countries, Europe and the United States. Uh, so if you look at this from the perspective of the United States, uh, the rapid rise that we've had in immigration over the last 20 or 25 years uh, now puts the immigrant population of the U.S. at around 15 percent. Uh, and the last time that immigrant population in the U.S. reached that level, which is in the early 1920s, uh, we had similar levels of uh, political backlash against that. So both these cultural and economic forces, I think, lead or have led many people to feel a sort of loss of control, a perception at least, of a loss of control uh, of change that's taking place. Economic, their economic future, their anxieties about cultural change. And I think these are large structural forces that are common to a lot of countries right now uh, that contribute quite a bit to what we're seeing with the way politics is changing. Um, but it's also true that there are particular ways, as I said, that democracy is, get, is structured that can lead these populist forces of anger and alienation and rage, disaffection, to be expressed in government or in politics, in elections, in one form or another, more, more powerfully, less powerfully. Uh, and those institutional differences uh, are ones that I want to talk a little bit about. Um, and here I want to focus, just to use this as an example, on the United States in particular. So we have moved in various ways uh, in directions that have, have undermined a lot of what I call the mediating forces or the institutional forces in democracy uh, that uh, used to play a very significant role in organizing our politics. Um, and here's the example I want to focus on because it, uh, it, it is very consequential 
in ways that, uh, that, that, that I think can be made pretty obvious um, fairly easily. And that is, um, we have shifted radically in ways most Americans don't understand, don't remember, don't appreciate, understandably, uh, the way in which we choose our candidates to become president, to run in the general election. So in the 1970s, uh, we shifted to the system that you're familiar with if you're, if you're American or if you follow American elections, uh, a system in which we now use these primary elections to choose who will be the nominee of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. And this is a, a purely you know, participatory, popular, or populist form of choice. Uh, it's the voters in these elections uh, who will directly decide who will be the nominee of the Republican or the Democratic Party for president. Uh, now, you probably take that as natural or just the only way to do this, or how else would you do this? Uh, but in fact, throughout American history until the 1970s, we had a very different system of selecting these candidates. It was a system in which voters directly played some role through a certain number of these primary elections, but in which the dominant role was played by elected figures from the political parties throughout the United States, nationally and at the state level, in these political party conventions that I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, that today are meaningless events because it's already been decided who the nominees will be. But it used to be the case that we had political party figures who were elected officials who had significant input in who the candidates were who ran for the party. Now in that system that we had until the 1970s, the political party figures played this, what I would call mediating or intermediating, intermediary role between the voters and who got chosen to run for president. This was a form of what we call, people who study this call peer review, where people who had experience with the various candidates, uh, who were in government, uh, had a much, much more significant role. In fact, today they have almost no role uh, in choosing who the candidates are. Now, in that older system, which saw political parties and saw political party figures as playing a desirable role in democracy, uh, more populist kinds of candidates who had limited experience or no experience in government uh, could not have gotten through this process. They would not have been selected to run for president. Uh, because the judgment of people who had been in government at the state level, at the national level, uh, filtered out the kinds of candidates who could get through this process and actually run in the, in the general election to become president. We got rid of all of that in the name of popular participation. The people should get to decide through these primaries directly. Uh, but one of the costs or consequence of that kind of institutional change is, as many people predicted at the time, who were political scientists, uh, much more populist, demagogic kinds of candidates who may have no experience in government and who may have no real ties to the political parties that they purportedly represent uh, would become much more likely to be nominated and therefore capable of being elected uh, to the chief executive's position in our country. This is a story, the, the larger point I want to illustrate through this story is that uh, as we have moved towards a political culture that celebrates direct popular participation in a way that's completely unmediated by other institutions, other forces, like political parties, which most people hate in many, many ways, but which play a very important role in actually forcing more centrist kinds of processes, uh, more moderating kinds of forces into the system. Um, by eliminating these kinds of roles, 
uh, we have made it, I think, much more likely that the kind of populist anger and alienation and rage that is fueled by things like these financial crises or other transformations get much more immediately and directly translated into our politics. So, you know, to make this more tangible, uh, a figure like a Donald Trump uh, would not have been capable of being nominated for president in the system that we used in the United States throughout our history until the 1970s. Um, his candidacy becomes possible as a result of this institutional change in which the voters in primary elections can completely sort of bypass uh, anything about the judgment of party figures, party figures nationally and locally and in the states, about the kinds of figures who ought to represent the party in the national election and the competition for president. Uh, so while it's uh, very common to sort of celebrate the virtues of popular participation, um, I think there's something significant that's been lost by destroying a lot of these mediating or intermediary institutions in democracy that make it more likely, not just in the United States, but in other parts of the world, uh, that uh, these more dangerous forces in many ways can be directly translated into politics, into government, than had been true when we still maintained a role for more of these moderating or mediating kinds of institutions in democracy. So I said I would talk for only 15 minutes. I think that's what I was asked to do, to leave time for questions. Uh, so let me stop there and see if that provokes uh, any uh, discussion. And I'm interested to hear uh, how thinking about political culture may relate to thinking about the issues that you're directly dealing with in the area of cultural diplomacy. Oh, There's no need for that, but sure. So, uh, of course, you know, everything I'm talking about is in the context of the people ultimately choosing the chief executive, the prime minister, the party leader, the president through, through a general election at the end of the day. But I think that democracy had always been structured in a much more complex and nuanced way than simply a, you know, uh, totally unmediated form of popular participation sort of in every arena and in every stage of the process. Uh, so just again to make this a little bit maybe too American focused for the moment, but in our primaries this time around on the Republican Party side, we had 17 candidates running. You can't even put those 17 people on the same stage to have a public debate. It's unmanageable at that size. Uh, so to filter through that number of candidates in some unmediated way for direct popular participation, uh, I think maybe putting too much pressure in a sense on, on the system or on uh, voters without any devices that filter out these candidates 
uh, to a set that is a smaller number on which it's easier to make to develop the information to make judgments about differences between particular people, what they stand for, uh, and the like. Uh, now, now the, I, I think part of what's gone on is there's such a, a distrust of experience even, or of expertise, uh, uh, a belief that uh, uh, cynicism, really, about a lot of these qualities uh, that I think can be very self-destructive, actually, for a democratic culture. Uh, so in this uh, era in which we so celebrate, I would say over-celebrate, the value of direct and immediate popular participation, you know, there are movements towards more referendum, letting people vote more directly on more issues. I think all of that's very problematic. Uh, and I think part of what I'm trying to do is to push back a bit against that culture uh, and, to, and to ask questions about whether uh, the best form of understanding democracy is one in which we do need various kinds of intermediate devices, a representative legislature uh, for decision making uh, in which experience can be built up, in which knowledge and expertise can be developed, in which trade-offs between issues can be negotiated, uh, not one in which the ideal ought to be all of us voting directly on every substantive issue and making these kinds of decisions. Um, so, uh, so yes, you're raising the right questions about the tensions and how to think about democracy. Um, I think we've moved very far, not just in the United States, but in many other places, uh, towards one side of this tension, that I, that I, and I think we're seeing some of the consequences of that, which maybe should give us uh, reason to start re-examining whether we want to kind of build back in, to the extent it's possible, uh, more role for various kinds of mediating forces in democracy. Hi, so my, my, my name is Ken I'm, I'm a student here at NYU. My question is, from India, I'm in India. Uh, we had elections uh, four years, two, two years back. And the election was won by Mr. Modi from BJP, right? And uh, during this particular elections, uh, the people uh, and the argument it happened in India was a huge debate in a sense that the people voted for Modi because of the figure which he portrayed as the Hindu figure, as the figure uh, that he was like, like the Trump of India, although he was a political leader and all that. So the, uh, the, and the argument was, uh, is democracy valid? When the people don't know what they're voting for, and when they are influenced by the rhetoric of, of, of a culture, of history, of, of tradition, and also very important fear that uh, yourself, that you are being threatened by the other, which in case of Modi became Pakistan and Muslims in the election time. So is that democracy valid when the people themselves don't know what they're voting for? Well, so the, you know, the, the premise of democracy, uh, right, is that at the end of the day, uh, the people should uh, have control over the decisions of who to give political power to, uh, that they should have the power to hold people in office accountable through elections and the like. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so uh, at the same time, liberal democracies have built, built in various kinds of checks on a purely kind of majoritarian political process that's what constitutionalism is about. Uh, that's what independent judiciaries are about. That's what Bill of Rights kinds of protections, individual rights protections enforced by a, a, an independent court are all about. Um, uh, so there's a recognition that there needs to be some set of checks and balances on pure majoritarian power, the power purely of election outcomes. But, uh, but at the end of the day, if you're committed to democracy, uh, you have to uh, accept that the final decision ultimately is, you know, a decision to be made by uh, by by the voters, uh, and you can't presume voters are voting uh, for reasons that make the outcome, you know, illegitimate just in and of itself. But what I'm saying is that there need we do need to be more aware than I think we have been, or, and 
aware in a way we used to be in most democracies, uh, that it's desirable still to have a variety of uh, intermediary institutions that play a significant role in structuring the process through which people make the ultimate choice and do have control over the ultimate choice. But I can't go as far as you know, endorsing the, the kind of way you put that, because that really is then uh, to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, is I because you mentioned populism. Okay, what do you think uh, is happening in populism now in this strong way again? Because the kind of populism that we are talking about basically is a uh, right wing, uh, almost fascism, right? Um, I mean, uh, making the, the point that I want to go. Um, in 1963, for example, we are in a country that, that the president was killed. He was a little, a little bit different than the others. Um, if you read the book of, you know, the attorney that was running the case, and if you watch the movie from Oliver Stone, when he's going to the jail to make an interview, so he was an homosexual guy they called William T. I think. He met some people that they were suspicious, you know, not directly, but also directly. He was asking in some point, because the attorney was getting very implicated about the loud people talking. And he said, okay, who killed the president? And the guy said, I don't know. I just know that I'm afraid that fascism is coming back. Um, yesterday, for example, we had the, the permanent member uh, from Hungary, the, the, foreign, the minister of foreign affairs. And we had an intervention, and I mentioned one relative of mine that has a diplomat in the past, he's, uh, he passed away, he's dead already, and also in the International League Committee, he was the president. And I mentioned, and he, that, that, meant, that comment awakes some people to come to me and talk even more things. And some of the people say, well, for example, you know, after the Second World War, at the end of war, when everything is based on agreement, you know, that some of the Nazis were recycled, but the U.S. Uh, regarding information, you know, escaped to East Europe and some another. Some of them escaped to my country, Spain, maybe to go to South America. Now some people they say that some of these, uh, you know, populist movements are, you know, funded by some money coming from the, some South American countries, some people say, you know. So, yeah, for example, and now what is the trade, you know? You know what's happening in Spain. You mentioned democracy as well, in Spain and Catalonia. We're afraid to me. It's not that uh, what is a bad thing, of course, uh, in the top. What it afraid me is not the fact that ministers are getting arrested, like in uh, Franco's time. It's not that the Spanish government is sending the army. We have seen worse things, you know? And it's not the fact that the intervention financially, the, the region, I mean, they don't have any uh, financial independence. You know, the payment has to be done again by the government. What afraid me is the silence of so-called, uh, you know, democratic bodies like the UN and also the European Parliament. Being, being in Europe is the framework of Europe, you know. Maybe in another country, you know, this is the wall is, uh, you know, having problems in some parts, but in Europe, that the silence of these bodies. So this populism coming back in that way is schizophrenia, conspiracy theory, <laughs> or is reality. Well, first of all, I want to take a teeny bit of issue with your, with your description at the outset, the very first thing you said. I think that we actually are seeing, to some extent, populism on both the left and the right rising, and more on the right right now, uh, but, uh, but certainly you know, in Greece, you see populism of both left and right versions. Uh, in our elections, you could see Bernie Sanders as kind of a populism from the left. Uh, and I think that, 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 that the forces that are driving that are, are significant. I mean, I, I'm, I don't in any way want to belittle people's uh, sense of economic grievance and alienation uh, and their, their circumstances. 
But the question is how that gets translated into politics and does it get translated into it in what I would call healthier or less healthy forms. Um, now, you know, you're referring so much to the Catalonia independence uh, issue and the, the effort to have a referendum that's not been endorsed by, by Spain as a whole, but by Catalonia. And that's much too much sort of local politics from my perspective to get, um, get very far into. Um, it is true, obviously, that the European Union is struggling very much right now uh, with whether it can do anything effective uh, in response to the rise of anti-democratic uh, forces uh, con in countries like Hungary and Poland, uh, in which you see one of the things that is always a danger in democracies, which is that once a party or gets elected to office, they use that power to try to manipulate the structure of democracy in a way that uh, eliminates or significantly suppresses the ability for competitive forces in opposition to challenge their ongoing power, whether it's the independence of the courts, the independence of the media, uh, the political opposition itself. Um, and that is always a risk in democracies, <laughs> that the set of forces that temporarily gain political power, uh, which are supposed to relinquish power if they're voted out of the next election, will try to use that power that they have to leverage themselves and entrench themselves into office more deeply by manipulating the ground rules of democracy itself. So the European Union is, is facing a very serious challenge now with the developments that have gone on in member states like Hungary and Poland. So far, they've been very ineffectual uh, in, uh, in, in figuring out how to engage that. Now, how, whether they can do anything or not, we'll, we'll see. But I, I think that is a very serious issue facing uh, Europe or facing the European Union in particular at the moment.